sing that song. He set me free. He set me free. Yes, he set me free. your blessing today in the Sunday school. Give us ears to hear your word. Bless us, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Wonderful study so far, and we're getting towards the end, but God's, God's going to help us. We want to start the video. Praise God. Thank you for coming. We appreciate you today. Memorial Stones telling the story of our church uh, and our fellowship. Um, just uh, got a lot to get through, so I'm going to dispense with our main verse, which is Joshua 4, 4 through 7. You can read that in your own time. Let's now, uh, I want to talk this morning about the split from Foursquare. We are, were originally, my father was saved in an organization called the Foursquare Gospel Church, and I've been telling uh, the story, the lead up, we are no longer in the four square and I'm explaining how that came to be. Uh, just as a, a preface there, we've had through the years, we have rebels, people that have left uh, our fellowship and they're, the line they, they love when they wanna rebel is you rebelled against four square. As though there is a moral equivalency, we left and planted thousands more churches and you know, more people getting saved and reaching nations. They leave, stop evangelizing, planting churches as though that's the same. But nonetheless, let's talk about the split from Foursquare. My <clears throat> father, we're now, I think when we last looked, we were up to about 1983. My, my father became more and more troubled about our relationship with Foursquare. Uh, we, the vision that God had given in uh, evangelism, discipleship, church planting, and world evangelism. And it became increasingly clear that we were not going to be able to coexist. But my father did not want to fight. He wasn't trying to campaign against Foursquare, wasn't trying to cause trouble. So my father's strategy was mostly he prayed. Have a, uh, a picture uh, here. Uh, they'll put it up. This is from my father's Bible. And uh, this says, you shall not go out with haste nor by flight, for the Lord will go before you. The God of Israel be your rear guard. And uh, you'll see there, this is January 30, 1982. What God spoke to him, <clears throat> he said this was planned and strategic positioning for a better witness. And this is what God spoke to him, is I don't have to fight, I don't have to uh, uh, cause uh, trouble, is God is going to do this for the betterment of his will. So you have to understand something, I've been repeatedly explaining the difference between a denomination and a fellowship. A denomination is centralized control. Uh, fellowship is not, that's not what it is. But one of the things you need to understand, denominations, their practices and even their beliefs are not necessarily set in stone. What they are, what they believe, how they operate. In many denominations, the denomination can change when they have a business meeting, people are allowed to make motions. You're seeing this uh, right now, you'll see it from time to time in the last year, the Southern Baptists and uh, Methodists, uh, I think it is, uh, have had numerous examples of this fighting over whether women pastors and homosexuals in, in ministry. So what happens is in, in a conference, convention, whatever they call it, or meetings before there of the executive, whatever it is, you can just, I make a motion. You can make a motion about anything, and then that is voted on. You have to understand now, in Foursquare Gospel Church, that's how they operated. In Australia, 
when they formed their constitution, part of their bylaws said every church gets two voting members. At these meetings that you decide things, every church legally, you have the legal right, you get two votes. I'm sure when they put that in, that sounded very fair and democratic. That was fine because in those days, the number of four square churches remained essentially the same. It never changed. They were not <clears throat> they were not planting churches, so to have that, you get two votes, is a great idea. The problem was, in Australia, we were a part of Foursquare, we were planting churches, a lot. And so, <clears throat> this, uh, the night that Lisa and I were sent out, from our church alone, four couples went out in one night. There were, I don't remember, there were either seven or 11 churches planted in that uh, uh, conference. So four to eight churches are planted every six months. There were not that many, if I remember right, there were only like 16 uh, churches, um, uh, four square churches in Australia. So here is the problem. We became a threat to four square. So think about their, how they're structured Theoretically, in the meeting at the convention, we could have made a motion. We didn't believe in women pastors, so we could say, I make a motion there are to be no women pastors in Foursquare. And we could have easily outvoted everyone. We could have said, no more Bible schools, because we don't operate by Bible schools. We believe in discipleship. So you see, we became a threat my, uh, God spoke to uh, my father, very, very interesting. He's praying about where things are headed with Foursquare, what's going to happen, and God spoke to him. Next picture, in this, Pharaoh rose up in the night, he and all his servants and the Egyptian, there's a great cry, there was not a house where there was not one dead, and verse 31, he called for Moses and Aaron by night and said, rise up and get forth from my people, both you and all of the people. Look at this, August 30 of 1983, and my father made a notation, God spoke to him within 30 days. This is gonna happen. You are gonna to be told to leave within 30 days. My father received a call from the international supervisor. You see the note, Rolf McPherson is Amy Semple McPherson's Son, he was the president of Foursquare at that time. This man called and informed my father, Rolf has made a decision. We want you to withdraw your churches from Foursquare. So pull them all out of Foursquare. None of us own property, so that was fine. It was easy to do. Uh, so we pulled out and formed the Potter's House Christian Fellowship of Australia, but this is how the split came. It was their choice. It originally was their instruction, and so we followed that. Now, initially, that was only in Australia because Australia had that in their constitution. I don't think it was the two voting member thing. I don't think it was quite like that in America. So my father's intention now we pull out in Australia and just continue doing, it didn't change our lives in any way. We just kept right on doing what we're supposed to be doing, but we're no longer with Foursquare. Dad's intention, this church in, in Prescott originally was Foursquare. His intention was to continue to stay and in Foursquare and keep doing what God told us to do from within but he didn't think they were gonna let him do this. That was his intention. Again, he wasn't campaigning, he wasn't rallying, uh, but he didn't think that they would do this. Here's another uh, picture out of his Bible. Uh, next one. And uh, is that the one? <laughs> don't, don't change on me here. Okay, for they have not rejected you, they've rejected me that I should not reign over them. And he's speaking about this, the International Board of Foursquare is what this is 
in reference to, this is in January of 1984. This is leading up, February was when they were going to have uh, their uh, convention. And so again, he felt God speaking to him that, uh, that there was going to come a rejection. But his conclusion was, I am not going to fight that. I am not trying to fight. I'm not trying to cause uh, trouble. Want next picture. Now you can go there. Uh, if he says, I have no delight in you, here am I. Let him do to me what seems good to him. February of 1984, and my father's note was, in the international conflict, I yield my cause to God. Let him vindicate. In other words, what my father is saying there is, I am not going to fight back. That is not, I am absolutely not wanting a fight, but he didn't believe that they were going to allow us to continue doing what we do from within Foursquare. Foursquare holds their convention every year. I don't know if they still do this, but they used to move it around. I told you one time they held it here. They held it in 1984 in Glorieta, New Mexico. There's a conference center uh, there on the way between uh, Albuquerque and Las Vegas, I think. They had a, a meeting there of the supervisors, the executive council before convention, and this is where they discuss business. And this is the time in which you are allowed to make motions. What do you think should happen? And your, any voting member was able to make a motion, so the, whoever was leading the meeting said, is there any business to discuss? Are there any motions to make? The very first man stood up and he said, I make a motion that we throw the Arizona Fellowship out of the Foursquare. That was the first one, and for the next two and a half hour, you have to imagine, husband, pastors and wives attended, my mom is sitting there, which I think, that sucks. But for the next two and a half hours, person after person stood and attacked my father and what we were doing and, and the, all the things they felt was wrong. My father would not fight back because that was what he felt from God. He wasn't trying to fight these people. He's going to leave it with God. So for two and a half hours, they actually left it kind of unresolved they never resolved that issue. I think what they did as a political move is they said, we're going to form a committee and look into that. That's a way of pushing it off in, in politics. So dad left there, and, and this is uh, kind of well known of, of uh, pastors of that day, is he left, went to, no, no cell phones in those days, went to a phone box at the convention center and called Harold Warner and he said, Harold, it's not gonna work. They're not gonna let us work from within. It's clear that there has to be a uh, separation. But again, dad didn't want to fight with them. So the following week, he called Foursquare headquarters and he asked the question, what do we have to do to be released without a fight? We don't wanna fight you, we don't wanna go to court, we don't wanna campaign. So what do we have to do if you don't want us to be in Foursquare? Now, clearly, we can't be in Foursquare. What do we got to do? And their answer was, buy the buildings. Their answer was, it was all about property. So you have to understand how Foursquare operated. If a local congregation, if you raise money to buy land, built a building, or if you purchased a building, in Foursquare, the local congregation did not ever own the building. They didn't hold the title. The international organization held the title. Now, the reason for that, what happens normally, there's always a reason for any kind of rule. And what had happened in the past is they had uh, uh, men who rose up, rogue pastors, who ripped them off who decided to no longer be in Foursquare and stole the property as they left. That is, that's their reasoning of why it was held uh, centrally. And so 
but they said, this is what it is. We had, remember we had a tiny little building on uh, Lincoln Street when we came that seated, you know, 65, 70 people. The, the church did own the property on Ruth Street. From within, in the congregation, we raised the money to build that building. And so now, what they said, even though we raised the money, they said, you have to buy the building from us. And so, in July of uh, 1984, at conference, we announced this, that we are leaving Foursquare, and that the price of that is we have to buy the building. And so, in that conference, an offering was raised, and we raised and paid $500,000 Two four square technically for a building that we had already already uh, uh, paid for. Uh, Tucson, I asked Harold Warner. They were the other church at that time, the only other church that actually owned property uh, on their own. And uh, so, what was the price for Harold to be released in the Tucson church? Harold Warner told me the other day. He said their price was twenty five thousand. And Harold, you know, he's in a wheelchair. He said they gave me the handicap discount. <laughs> <laughs> so that, that probably looked a little better. So people, you know, today are, you know, the, can you believe it? We had to, to pay. I'm actually okay with this, is that I understand the reasoning. It's to prevent rogue pastors from stealing. But nonetheless, that is what we do. So from that moment, all of our churches, all of our fellowship churches that at that time was like 265 churches, we all withdrew from Foursquare around the world. Uh, we, there were churches that uh, were in existing Foursquare buildings. In that case, they simply handed the building back to Foursquare and went and rented or ultimately bought on their own. But from July of 1984, all of our churches around the world, any of them that still called themselves Foursquare, we all changed our name. Typically, uh, you know, our umbrella organization is Christian Fellowship Ministries, but we go by the Potter's House, the Door, or Victory Chapel. Those are the three most uh, common names. What's, what's sad about that is you, in later years, you could hear how did Foursquare view that? And one comment that I think was sad, how did they view losing 265 churches that were church planting centers that were reaching the world? They said, at least we didn't lose any property. And that was my dad's point all along. He said, the problem with denominations is they start valuing the wrong things and one of the things he said all along is he said denominations value property over people. But that was their uh, uh, opinion. So this then brings us to the conclusion of Foursquare. I've given you the long, it was a 14-year path to us no longer being in Foursquare. It began with no Bible schools. We don't believe in Bible schools, which goes against them. Then we planted churches, these men who didn't go to Bible school, and they succeeded then territorial tensions when we planted men in areas where a man felt he was in charge. We don't believe in women pastors. That's, absolute, that's their holy grail right there. Uh, the 1978 convention when my father called out and spoke boldly of, of what they should be. Uh, international church planting by not you know, sending the money directly. That's what we talked about last time. The final step was the threat that the Australian Foursquare churches uh, were under because of our church planting. That is what led, it was their initial decision, we want you to withdraw. So that's it. Uh, it's fascinating, we're, we're almost done with the project. Very soon we're gonna make every single issue of the trumpet available to you. You can, you can look at them online, read them all the way back. Uh, what is, uh, uh, what's, Amazing, I was fascinated. I couldn't wait to get these scans so I could see what was said when we left Foursquare. You know what was said in the trunk when we left Foursquare? Absolutely nothing. 
<laughs> we just kept on because it didn't make any difference to us. <laughs> we just kept doing what we were called to do. Our calling is conversions through evangelism, discipleship, church planting, world evangelism. When we left Foursquare, we just kept doing that and nothing changed. Let's talk about a second thing in our history, and that is my father's return to Australia. I explained to you when dad went to Australia, his heart was actually, he wanted to stay there forever. Uh, a man who would not do right wanted to change the Prescott Church and the fellowship. Uh, dad was forced to return and take the Prescott Church back. But dad had a supernatural love for Australia. And what he desired was he wanted it to reach its full potential. When he left uh, he left a, a man in charge, and uh, the man he left was struggling in numbers of areas. And what Dad's real concern was, he felt that the potential of the nation was being hindered by that man and in, in the, what, what he was doing. So Dad was trying to arrange things in Prescott so that he could return to Australia, numbers of things, and I, I'm telling you this from personal experience, I was there. In the church, the, the pastor he left in, in Perth was carnal and allowed blatant immorality. Fornication, people sleeping together, they're not married, was rampant throughout the church. Uh, we had two homosexuals involved in uh, singing on stage in there and this was allowed and uh, nothing was ever done about that. The pastor, he, what he loved, what he talked was movies and television and that's how he spent a great deal of his time was watching movies and watching TV. Began to shift the church subtly away from the core of evangelism and discipleship. And so in this, there's a, a personal dimension, Lisa and I were in the church at that time. I was a disciple. I had been called. I wanted to preach the gospel. So now this is the, the atmosphere and how it affected us personally. In my several years of my discipleship there, it, it involved watching a lot of movies and TV with the pastor, which is very odd. I want to tell you that's a weird feeling. My father came back, I don't remember if this was for a conference or uh, to, to preach, and the, the pastor at the time at the hotel, he had the great idea of putting a movie on for my father with, you know, like we're all going to watch a movie together. You have to understand, I, I'm young and dumb, this is what we did normally with the pastor, so this was not shocking to me, but you imagine my father, this man puts a movie on in which is filled with swearing and sexual innuendos, and my father said, turn it off. He was, he was ticked uh, about this. And in later years, dad could see what was happening in the church. He's seeing this man, he's, see, this, this man didn't get it. In later, later years, he would often tell people, I had to return to Australia, partly to rescue Greg and Lisa of which I am very grateful that he made that decision. Little, little side note, I'm, I'm just gonna hit this in passing. This is actually where ministry standards stem from, in, in part. Through the years of our fellowship, we had a few pastors that fell into immorality. They committed adultery, and so when that would happen, of course, my father is asking, how did you get to this point? And a common denominator was movies and uh, TV watching that opened the door to uncleanness. And then now in the Perth church, it was a test case of what that released in a congregation, carnality and immorality, what it hurts is dominion and discipleship. Let's get two scriptures. Genesis 38, 18. He said, what pledge should I give you? Your seal and its cord and the staff in your hand, she answered. So he gave them to her and slept with her and she became pregnant by him. 
Okay, your seal. Whenever there is moral uncleanness, the seal was a symbol of authority. That's how you transact business. We're talking about kingdom business. You lose something. And this is why it is not compatible. 2 Timothy 2.21. Therefore, if anyone cleanses himself from the latter, he will be a vessel for honor, sanctified and useful for the master, prepared for every good work. Okay, so it is cleansing and purity that prepare the way for a good work. So I'm just giving that in passing. This is actually where the, uh, this idea is what it releases in a congregation. 1985, my uh, parents arranged to return to Australia. We have a, a picture here. And, uh, and that looks out of order. Have you skipped one? I think you've skipped one there. But anyway, okay. So um, he was going to uh, return. So what he did is dad arranged for a, a man to, to uh, pastor the Prescott congregation. And uh, this is now a different man. This is the second time dad's going to do this. And he took over the pastorate of the church in Perth, West Australia. We had now moved from where we were in Mount Lawley. Now it was located in a suburb called Scarborough. Perth was probably 800,000, under a million in those days. But Scarborough was two blocks from the beach. That is where you see, the, when I showed before, the photos of baptisms. We would do that down in Scarborough. The moment that Dad took over the church in Perth, he had to clean house, literally. He had to clean house morally. I, uh, I'm, I was trying to think of the exact number. I believe the number could be... When Dad took over, he started preaching on sin. He started disciplining uh, uh, people who were immoral. Uh, he was not okay with the homosexual singing on stage. That's not okay with him. He's preaching on this. I believe the number of people that we wound up losing from the church could have been as high as 170 people because I'm telling you it was rampant uh, in the church. What's amazing is even though we are losing people on a weekly basis, it didn't matter because we were getting people saved and adding people. They were locking in dramatically so you didn't know. We had a man actually was keeping track, but us in the church, we didn't even notice because the church was just powering on. Now we get to some photos here. I think that's what the next photo is. is this is an altar call, uh, one of the early altar calls. Next photo uh, here, that is in Scarborough. That's two blocks from where our church is located. I played numerous concerts uh, there. That's a different band on the left at the beach. Here is our band that was originally called 180. You recognize Paul Graham. Uh, that has uh, come here and uh, preached here. That's me on drums. Lisa is singing there. And that was a, an outreach. Only the Lord knows where that one was. We did so many. Next uh, photo is here now is at the beach. This is a beach baptism. There's Greg showing his legs again. Uh, you're still jealous, I know. And here baptizing people at the beach. We could... We were only two blocks from the beach. You could get people saved. We're going down to the beach and we baptize right at, at the beach. Next photo. This is the building. This is 62 Scarborough Beach Road. This is a, a, a monument to me. That is the building where Lisa and I were married. This is where uh, I preached my first altar call. Uh, I ultimately was on staff in that building when we were sent out. That was the building. We played many, many concerts uh, in that building. Next uh, photo is uh, here is that building from the inside, absolutely packed out, predominantly young people. I mean, it was alive. And so even though Dad was cleaning house, God was adding daily such as should be saved, and God was helping us. Next photo is during this era. Here is a young and thin Paul Graham. 
uh, with dad, and uh, this is uh, in that same era. Dad not only cleaned house morally, he set things back on track. And so this was amazing. It was, for Lisa and I, it was like coming out of a fog. Uh, Dad had a way of reminding you what we are supposed to be doing. And it was like, oh yeah, it's supposed to be about people and calling, the calling of God. I realized, uh, yeah, I won't bore you with details of what was how I got there, but I realized I didn't have a love for people like my father had. And I asked him, how do you get that? How do you get a love for people? And my father said, Greg, pray that God gives you a burden for souls and a love for people. And that's what I began to pray, and that's what God did. Dad, the moment he took over, he turbocharged discipleship, got it back on track. The atmosphere of the church absolutely changed from Movies, talking about the latest movies, to the will of God. Discipleship, set it on track, and uh, he began planting churches, a lot of them. Next photo, here's Alan and Merle Jones, uh, uh, the first Aboriginal couple that was ever sent out. Is uh, Alan, he actually just passed away, I think, a, a couple of months ago. Alan and Merle were sent out. I think Dad is sending them to Sydney. Uh, in that photo, the next photo here is uh, uh, the church that is now Waltham Forest, that couple in the bottom right, Peter and Peter Behrman. You see there, that is a picture of the conference that we met for a while in the Pagoda Ballroom until we couldn't uh, fit in there anymore. But uh, that couple, that was the couple that was sent out before Lisa and I. And so dad got things back on track. I want to tell you about my father's wisdom. My father was a wise man, and one of the things my father was wise in is decisions. So dad came back probably late July of 85. It's in August that we have our conference, and so uh, he, is, he sent that couple out. Now he needs a concert director. Who is he going to choose? When dad came, he's only here for weeks. He's assessing, talking. Uh, watching, dad felt that Lisa and I, that we were the best uh, choice to be the next concert directors, but dad understood human nature. He knew what would happen is if he arrived and says, and Greg and Lisa are going to go on staff as concert directors, people are going to say, oh yeah, you just chose him because he's your son. Like, I've never heard that one before in my whole life, I want to tell you that. <laughs> so my father's wisdom is he didn't rush. He didn't just make an arbitrary decision. In his wisdom, and think about how many wise, did, he could choose whatever he wants. He had shown that he's very good at making decisions, but what he did is he started asking people, who do you think should be, this is not a popularity contest, but he wanted to hear from uh, other people, who do you think should be the concert director? This is actually a biblical principle, Acts 6, verse 3. Brothers, choose seven men from among you who are known to be full of the spirit and wisdom. We will turn their, this responsibility over to them. Okay, so this is biblical. What that means is when someone has a touch of God on their life, other people should be able to see it. Now, sometimes, you know, we're surprised, but it's rare that we ever plant someone and people go, what? <laughs> what in the world? So this is what dad did, and apparently when he spoke to all kinds of people, they felt that there was some kind of consensus that Lisa and I were the best choice. And so in October of 1985, when I, when I moved to Australia, October of 81, I began a four-year apprenticeship. The moment that I fin finished uh, my apprenticeship, we, uh, my dad immediately asked, us to come on staff as concert directors. I, I want to give you a, a, a final thought here. I'm telling stories, and we'll continue to do so, of nations, people, different ones, because I'm, I'm trying to give you the idea that this is not a program. God is involved in this. My father's statement again and again, this is a work of God and not of man. 
If it is of God, one of the things that you learn, I've been telling some stories, I'll tell more, God is able to guide us into his will. So, I first learned this when we were going to be sent out in February of 1986. I had only been on staff for four months, and now it's conference time in, in February. I was at a disadvantage. I moved to Australia in 1981, apart from the few little country towns in West Australia. I had never been anywhere. Uh, and so uh, everybody else who was on staff, they're going to go somewhere else uh, unless it was a crisis or a need. Often it went like this. I want to go to that city. Why? Because that's where I grew up. I want to go to that city. Why? That's where I went to university. I want to go to that city. That's where I used to serve for. They had a natural connection. I hadn't been anywhere. So I didn't have any natural leaning of, of where to go. And God was not saying, Greg, like, yes, Lord, where should I go? So what I did, I used common sense. Common sense in godly things is holy logic. This is how I thought. I'm, I'm from Prescott, Arizona. Remember, Prescott was 13,000 people we moved here. There were two major cities, one of 5 million, one of 4 million. I thought that was just too big. I didn't think I could handle a city of, of millions. On the other hand, I hate small towns. <laughs> so I began logically then, I began looking for cities of at least 50,000 and maybe 500,000 and under. For some of you young people, I have to educate you now, there didn't used to be Google. I don't know if you know that. So I had to buy an atlas. It was a book of maps and information. I bought an Australian atlas, and I started looking, and I found three options um, uh, in Australia. Two of them were in New South Wales, Newcastle, Wollongong. And then on the island of Tasmania, a city called Launceston, on that island. So I called the, the area overseer in, in, in the place where two of those cities were located. What do you think about them? Usually he raved. He was like the evangelist for New South Wales. I said, what do you think about these cities? And he said, yeah, they're okay. He wasn't enthusiastic. I'm going to move my life there. If you're not into it, I'm not excited about it. I called the pastor who was uh, on the island of Tasmania in a place called Hobart. And I said, what do you think of Launceston? He raved, oh man, that's the greatest city. I wish I went there, it's, it's, it's tremendous. And so I said, okay, just based on holy logic, it's 10.30 in the morning, Lisa and I made a decision, we are going to go to Launceston, Tasmania. I had never heard of this place until two days before when I bought this atlas and started looking. Let me show you a picture of the beautiful city of Launceston located in the Tamar Valley, beautiful uh, city. I never realized how beautiful it was when we were there. I, we were working our butts off, so I, ne <laughs> I, I missed how beautiful it was. It is a fantastic. 10.30, we're gonna go to Launceston. We had arranged to go to lunch with a couple. Two hours later, we're sitting at lunch, and the lady said, I am praying because we really need a church in Launceston, Tasmania. I never heard of this place before. The next night, Lisa and I go to a fellowship, a church, there's a bunch of people there, and I'm talking to a man, and out of the blue, he said, I am praying for a church. We need a church in Launceston, Tasmania. So this was clearly uh, God, uh, any of your kids, I can show you the next picture. That is a Tasmanian devil. <laughs> they really do exist. You think it's a cartoon that's uh, really there. Uh, th those are the ones that are outside the church. I had a few in the church, but that's a different, <laughs> uh, a different that's a Tassie devil. So, but nonetheless, on the basis of this, uh, so we're taking this, man, this is great. We're going to go. God confirmed we're going to go. So February 7th. 
1986, we were announced, Greg and Lisa Mitchell are going into Launceston, Tasmania. I'll show you two photos. Here's the first one. This is the conference. We now had to move to the Church of Christ building because we outgrew the other one. And this is where we met for conference. And uh, here is the photo in the trumpet of a young Greg and Lisa that we were sent to Launceston, Tasmania. That is Friday night in conference. The next night, Saturday night, we're playing the concert. A lady lifts her hand. I'm pulling the altar call. A lady lifts her hand and comes down for salvation. Lisa prays with her the sinner's prayer and asks her, where are you from? She says, I'm from Launceston, Tasmania. (laughs) I'm like, why are you here? And here is the story. Her husband and her smoked a lot of weed. Their drug dealer said, by the way, I'm going on holiday. You're not going to be able to buy any drugs. They said, where are you going? They said, he says, I'm going on, on holiday to Perth, West Australia. They had friends there. They said, we're coming too because they could get drugs. So when they're there, her friend had gotten saved and invited her to the concert the night after we are announced to go there. Grisina was her name. We called her Grizz. She had gotten saved, went back home, and she started telling all of her friends. Grizz, is, she's still in the church to this day, such an interesting lady. She had friends. She was like the bridge between two completely different worlds. On the one hand, she was friends with a crowd of people from a bike gang called Satan's Riders. She was, that was one crowd. On the other hand, she had friends that were together. They owned houses and jobs and, and all that. But she began telling all of her friends, we arrived on Tuesday. Thursday, we had Bible study in Grizz's house. And the wife of the vice president of Satan's Writers got saved on Thursday, two days after we got there. Uh, we had a, she had other friends that... Uh, she invited us uh, to uh, meet. One night she asked us, she said, would you like to go to a fashion show? I was like, no, I don't want a fashion show. To do it. Why? She said, because my, my friend did this course. It's, she's actually, it's part of her course. She's graduating, but all my friends are going to be there. She says, I want you to meet them so you can tell them about Jesus. We said, I love fashion shows. I'd love to go. <laughs> and so... Sure enough, at that fashion show during the break, we met her friend, Sonia. Now Sonia Christides is in the Perth Church, married a guy from there. Mike and Alina Cook. i never forget it. Mike with a beer, with a cigarette, and we are telling him we are there to tell them about Jesus Christ in the middle of this fashion show. Cigarette smoke and stinks of booze, but we witnessed to them those people got saved. I got a picture here of uh, that one. I don't remember what. Oh, that was on the way to Launceston. I forgot about that one. That was when we left to go to Launceston. Next photo. I somehow got them out of order. Is here in the middle. That is Grizz. Still in this uh, now. Uh, I can't remember her last name. She's married to Vili, but is still in the church to this day on the right. That lady was the vice president's wife of Satan's writers, got powerfully saved. Next photo, Uh, here we are. There is Mike and Alina Cook. That is the couple that we witnessed to at the fashion show. And uh, here, John McVilly later on got saved as well. And uh, so God began doing something. So now Launceston, Tasmania, this community of 50,000 people, we began outreaching and building a work for God just like what I had seen as a boy in Prescott and just what I saw as a disciple in Perth. We have some photos here. This is the mall. In English nations, malls are not buildings. It's outdoor, brick paved. It's a street they've paved, and that's where you shop. And so here we are doing a concert 
and doing an outreach there, exactly what I had seen in Prescott, exactly what I had seen in Perth. We began to build a work for God. Next photo, uh, here I am in front of the, the, the building. In those days, the holy colors were orange and black. I don't know why Halloween was a great color, but that's what we did. This was next door to a gun shop. And uh, here, go ahead, next photo. Here are some of our early converts. Sonia, the, uh, the far right, that is Alina Cook, pastor's wife to this day. Uh, Sonia is the one, the next one over second from the right. She's the one that we met at the fashion show. And then uh, uh, two other uh, early converts. Next photo. Uh, here we are, Mike Cook on the right. He is now pastoring. That's Alina's brother on the left, early converts. God was saving women. God was saving men. Next photo. Here is an article. They came and interviewed me uh, on there. And uh, one of the lines, you, you, you won't be able to see it, but one of the lines that I uh, say in there is people are mistaken if they think they can live like the rest of the world and call themselves Christian and still going to be certain of going to heaven. A local pastor was outraged at my statement. He wrote a letter to the editor and he called me Brimstone Bill uh, after that. <laughs> so we were uh, making waves in, in uh, Launceston. Next photo, uh, here is Mike and Alita Cook wound up there pastoring uh, to this day. Uh, they wound up becoming pastors and uh, pastoring in Melbourne, Australia, in an area called Box Hill. So here is my, my point. I learned that that was not, this was not a master plan that a man said, you go here, you do that. That was God. If you want to do God's will, I want to tell you, God will guide you. And that is where I saw it, and then I, I've seen it again and again in my ministry in personally, God is able to guide. And that's true for you. If you'll keep your heart right, if you'll ask God for help, God knows everything. And if you'll trust him, he is able to guide his children. That is a miracle dimension. One more verse, Isaiah 48, verse 17. Thus says the Lord, your redeemer, the Holy One of Israel. I am the Lord, your God, who teaches you to profit who leads you by the way you should go. Okay, I teach you to profit, or in other words, I teach you how things will go well, and I will lead you. That is every believer. Pause and get ready for service.